Good evening. How's everyone doing this evening? We're going to get started a little bit early and do a sound check, of course. And just do my normal run throughs. So if you happen to be on right now, if you could go ahead and drop me a line in the comments or the Facebook uh, chat feed, that would be great. So we're going to be talking about a lot of interesting organisms tonight, FBI, fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates. As you may know, a lot of decomposers are actually really tasty. And we'll talk about some of those delicious decomposer edibles here in just a little while. How's everyone doing this evening? Doing all right? Ready for tonight's program? I'm pretty excited about it. I'm pretty much always excited about programming. But I must say that I do have some favorite decomposers. As we know, based on the description for tonight's program, Fungi are decomposers. And fungi that I love to enjoy include morel mushrooms, which we did a program on last year, uh, the delicious, delectable morel mushrooms, the uh, steak of the mushroom world, if you will. Um, I also like what bacteria can do for the foods that I eat, um, including cheeses and yogurts. And invertebrates, uh, there's some in there that are pretty tasty too, but we'll wait till we get to that point before we discuss those. Just got a couple minutes here now before we get started. I really think that this program, <coughs> pardon me, is important for us to really appreciate some underappreciated organisms. We've got just about a minute here. We'll go ahead and get started. It is 6 p.m. Today is Thursday, July 15th. Hello, my name is Steph Morissette, and I'm happy to bring the FBI program to you this evening on behalf of Crawfordsville District Public Library. Tonight we're going to be learning about various fungi, uh, several types of bacteria, and a multitude of invertebrates. And we're going to dissect a bit of the decomposers in the food chain and uh, how, they're a vital, how they are of vital importance to the food chain. Because without our decomposers, we would be neck deep in fruit rinds and vegetable scraps, dead leaves, and many other things as well. So uh, hopefully we'll have a greater appreciation for some of our decomposers after the completion of tonight's program. Decomposers are also known as saprotrophs, which means they're organisms 
that break down dead or decaying organic matter and return it to the soil for other organisms to utilize. And by doing this, saprotrophs or decomposers actually increase what's called the bioavailability of nutrients for other organisms. So bio meaning life and availability meaning available to life. So by breaking down this, this matter, this uh, hummus, then we are actually helping other organisms to survive and thrive. So the fungi, bacteria, and invertebrates are what we'll be discussing this evening, and in particular, the nutritional relationships that they all share, and sometimes within, uh, within each other. We're just going to jump right into it. Some characteristics of decomposers or of fungi include the mushrooms and our toadstools, uh, various molds, mildews, and even yeasts, believe it or not. And fungi cont contain chitin, which is of structural support for the fungi, but it's also the same substance that is composed of crustaceans and the bodies of insects, so it's, it makes up their exoskeletons. So interestingly enough, fungi also use chitin as a form of structural support. And as you look at these images here, you see they look sort of thread-like and sort of uh, spread out. And these little individual threads or cylindrical structures are called hyphae. So each of those individual white threads that you see are con considered hyphae. And when the hyphae all act together in components, they make up what's called mycelium and they return nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and also carbon back into the environment, again, for other organisms to use. What's interesting about the mycelium that we just discussed is that these mycelium can form what's called a mycelial network. And by this, it simply meant that multiple hyphae from a complex fungi or, an, or a system of complex fungi will work together and form what's called the mycelial network. And it can actually, through the underground, connect different species of trees or different plants and different organisms. So it's almost like a communication uh, network between organisms underground. And so fungi really play an important, important, important part in that role by breaking down uh, organic matter and then having it bioavailable for other organisms to use. All this happening underground. And we're not talking about just the fungal, uh, the, the fungal that's above the ground. The, this is all what happens under the ground. We have a multitude of different fungus that we could talk about tonight, but we're really going to focus on just three larger groups. The first group we're going to discuss are basidiomycetes, and this includes uh, your, your mushrooms and puffballs, uh, what are called bracket fungi. There's also jelly fungi, which they, they look just like jellies. There's chanterelle mushrooms, which are used widely in cooking, as well as smuts, bumps, and rusts, and we'll see an example of a smut here in a minute. We also have ascomycetes, and these are sac fungi, these are the family that morel mushrooms belong to, and if any of you remember the program we had on morel mushrooms last year, this is the group that they fit into. They're also a more developed type of sac fungi, so the, the primitive sac fungi are much smaller, and the morels are much more advanced, so they have a lot more sac-like structure to them. Truffles are in this category as well as different kinds of yeasts that are used to leaven bread as well as brew beer. Um, and even dead man's fingers. But we don't have to worry about eating dead man's fingers. I just wanted to throw that in there, especially when you see the image I'm gonna show you here in a minute, it's pretty creepy. And then finally we have gastromyces, and these include organism, um, fungi like the earth stars, stink horns, and false truffles. It's important to mention here that there, in this image, there are two groups of uh, macrofungi that we were looking at, the basidiomycota and the ascomycota there on the left-hand side, those images there. And then the mycorrhizal species are the ones that all happen underground. So the other three 
uh, images that you see there in this diagram are, you know, they create that mycelial mat all underground. Here are some visual examples of basidiomycetes. There's the chanterelle mushrooms, puffballs, which are also edible. I've not personally had a puffball, but I have heard of people that will actually hunt them out and slice them up and fry them. Certain types of bracket fungi can be edible. Um, if you're going to hunt for wild mushrooms, uh, it's definitely important you take someone with you who knows what they're looking for. And finally, in this image, we have a smut. This is specifically a corn smut. It is a fungus that grows on corn. Now, whether this variety of smut is edible or not, I'm not sure, but there are types of smuts that are edible. Ascomycetes, here we have our morel mushroom. And if you look over to the upper right-hand image, you see the cup fungi. This is the primitive cousin of the morel mushroom. So if you look at the two of those, you can almost see how the cup fungi could be superimposed on the morel mushroom and makes up these tiny cups in the pits of the morel mushroom. Uh, but I'm digressing on fungi. <laughs> to keep going forward, truffles. I haven't met a truffle that I didn't like yet. Um, so they are edible. And then here in the lower right hand image, we have a picture of dead man's fingers. And they're just really creepy. Um, I actually saw these once growing in the woods and I was terrified. Uh, because they really look like what I would consider dead fingers to resemble. But you don't want to eat them. And finally, in the gastromycetes group, we have stinkhorns, earth stars, and false truffles. Stinkhorns are edible, but why would you want to, considering the stink they produce? But the other two images that you see, the image of the earth star and false truffles, you definitely wouldn't want to eat those there might be repercussions. Now, fungi, not only are they decomposers that break down all this dead and decaying organic matter, we use them as a food source, as I mentioned, before the program and also addressed during the program. But this includes like your button mushrooms, portabellas, shiitakes, chanterelles, and again, the morel mushrooms. But different types of fungi can also be used to produce medicines, specifically antibiotics and specifically penicillin. Now the mold type of penicillium, there are over 300 species of this fungi alone. And so we can get a wealth of medications, like I said, specifically in the penicillium, penicillin family from this type of mold. Some species of fungi are used in cheese making and bread baking. So we talked about our, our yeasts a little bit earlier. So our simple fungi here, the yeasts, can help us brew beer and ales and help us make blue cheese. You have to be careful about ingesting fungi because some of them can be poisonous if ingested. Uh, so like I mentioned, if you ever go out into the woods and you're hunting, uh, different fungi, be sure you have someone who knows what they're doing with you, someone who's trained in that. We're going to jump right into bacteria and talk about some characteristics of bacteria. Now, as we know, when we hear bacteria, we think of germs, correct? Um, a lot of bacteria have been grouped into the germ category, and I think sometimes that germs could be a derogatory term for some of the bacteria that are actually beneficial for us. We'll talk about a couple of those here in a minute. But what's interesting about bacteria, bacteria other than their microorganisms, and we can't see them with the naked eye, we need a microscope for that. These guys belong to the kingdom Monera, which are all prokaryotic. They, that means that these these bacteria lack a nucleus in the center of the cell and that cellular components such as their DNA sort of just floats around inside the cell and they don't have really any true location. Uh, they also have what's called a capsule that surrounds the entire bacterial cell and protects it, sort of like a cell wall in a plant. Um, and these guys are, 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 are pretty primitive. 
Bacteria are our primary decomposers, and they can absorb food and other nutrients through the cell wall, through their capsule and cell wall, and then ingest it that way and turn it into usable energies. So bacteria can be harmful or helpful depending on their use or uh, other constituents about them. Let's break down the kingdom Monera. We have eubacteria and archaeobacteria. The reason I wanted to mention this is that eubacteria could be considered new bacteria, as long as you don't put a time scale on that, and archaeobacteria can be considered ancient bacteria. Well, eubacteria, this includes most bacterias that we know of. Some of them can make their own food, while others are heterotrophic, which means that they rely on a food source outside of themselves. But there are exceptions to that, like blue-green algae, which is not even algae at all, it's a bacteria. And it's called a cyanobacteria. Cyano means blue, so you put blue bacteria together. That's where you kind of get the idea it looks like an algae. But this cyanobacteria is photosynthetic and it hangs out in heavily moist soils or in water. And if you look at the two lower images, you can see uh, the green uh, strands in the water there on the right-hand side, and then a close-up image of the links of these um, blue-green cyanobacteria. Archaea bacteria, on the other hand, are ancient bacteria or the oldest known category of bacteria. They as well may or may not make their own food. But what's very significant about archaea bacteria is that they can live in extreme environments that would otherwise seem inhospitable to any other organism. These environments include things like hot springs, volcanoes, deep ocean vents on the bottom of the seafloor, even in sewage, animal intestines, and even nuclear waste sites. So they are specially adapted to each of these environments in order to maximize uh, decomposition of said items. What sets archaeobacteria off from eubacteria is that it has a different cellular membrane structure as well as the RNA composition. RNA is another replicative uh, form of um, genetic expression. So it's not DNA, but it works very closely hand in hand with DNA, but this is RNA. Archaea bacteria and some eubacteria can survive in both aerobic and anaerobic conditions. Aerobic means in the presence of air, and anaerobic means in an oxygen deprived environment where there is little to no oxygen. And some of these anaerobic type conditions that bacteria live in can cause some foul smelling odors like methane. And one we really don't like to think about, but body odor is another one that once we sweat and we sort of get, um, you get stinky after a while. And these are bacteria that are starting to break down the, uh, the little bits of sweat in, um, in your body. But again, bacteria can be helpful in fermenting foods such as sauerkraut and various different kinds of ciders. And one other thing I wanted to mention, I always have so much to talk about with bacteria. Um, they're, they're, they're both prokaryotic, both eubacteria and archaeobacteria. So all their cellular components just float around in there. This is just a physical representation of the major differences between archaea bacteria and eubacteria. If you look to the left hand side of this image, you see there's archaea bacteria there. And if you look at them, they mostly look very similar in their shape. But if you look at the eubacteria on the right hand side, you can see there are several different shapes there. So the eu or the new bacteria have developed uh, new shapes over the course of their evolution. There are three main types of bacteria, at least the shapes that we're going to talk about. We have spherical or cocci, rod or bacilli, and spiral or spirilla. So you can see these examples look very much uh, like circles, rods, and spirals. 
We mentioned the bacteria can be harmful or helpful depending on its use or what it's doing. Harmful bacteria can include E. coli, salmonella, which we've heard of that too with um, some contamination of foods, pseudomonas, which can cause pneumonia, hepatitis, tuberculosis, streptococci, which would be your strep throat or your strep infections, shigella, which causes shigellosis, and then we also have staphylococcus, which is, if you've ever heard of, oh, I have a staph infection, it's generally a, a surficial um, infection. Say you were to have a cut and it became red and inflamed, chances are you might have a staph infection in there. Bacteria just all over play such a complex role in all our environments that it's easy for us to overlook how important they are as decomposers. Helpful bacteria include ones like Bacillus, Lactobacillus, and Acidophilus. Now, lacto means milk, right? And Acidophilus is, um, well, Bacillus, Lactobacillus, and Acidophilus are all types of bacteria that can help with things like yogurt making, um, the cultures in yogurts, uh, cottage cheese, so it's a bit of a fermentation process as well. I mentioned earlier on in our slides when we were talking about bacteria that most people associate bacteria with germs. And I think that germ gets a negative connotation because there are so many helpful types of bacteria. For instance, not only do they help our gut health and keep our flora and fauna balanced in our intestines and throughout, but they also, as I mentioned, impact so many different environments. And we're gonna talk about some of those coming up next. In your compost pile, we have what are called extremophiles. Now, extremophiles are bacteria that live in extremely inhospitable environments that other organs, organisms cannot occupy. And that leaves a lot of room there for uh, environments that bacteria can be helpful in. So we have psychrophilic bacteria or cold loving bacteria. They're the first bacteria that start to get to work in your compost pile and they're responsible for the first little hints of heat that you might feel as you're turning your compost. We also have thermophilic bacteria or heat loving bacteria. These bacteria are responsible for temperature spikes in your compost. And then we also have mesophilic bacteria which they're just bacteria that's interspersed throughout. But what I wanted to mention here about the thermophilic bacteria is if you've ever noticed, if you've ever driven by say a landscaping company and they have large mulch piles, sometimes in the winter you can see them steaming. And this is due to those thermophilic bacteria that are at work in the compost pile, breaking it all down. Another type of extremophile is called a halophile and halo means salt. So a halophile is a salt loving bacteria. We'll see an example of that here in a few minutes. This image I wanted to show some of the different environments that bacteria can live in. Sea ice, mud volcanoes, hydrothermal vents under the ocean, hot springs, hyperacidic lakes, deserts, acid mine drainage, deep sea, there we go, hydrothermal vents, even deep sea or shallow water. Um, just so many nuclear contaminated sites, it, could ju it just keeps going. Here are some real life images. Uh, starting on the left, we have a deep sea thermal vent. You see the stacks on there. The image in the center is of a geyser from Yellowstone National Park. You can see the rust colored discolorations in the front of the image. Those are from those extremophile bacteria. In the upper right hand image, those are the pink salt lakes of California, so there's where our halophiles would be hanging out. And then finally, some volcanic loving bacteria in the lower right hand image, and that image comes to us from Ethiopia, where uh, past volcanic activity had caused a rise in these extremophilic bacteria. One final thought on bacteria, this is further evidence of extremal files at work. This is Grand Prismatic Spring in Yellowstone National Park. 
These beautiful colors that you see here in this image that was taken from a satellite actually uh, are caused by the bacteria. And what the bacteria are doing is they're oxidizing inorganic compounds. Those inorganic or non-living compounds that the bacteria are using to convert into their food source include non-living uh, compounds such as ammonium, sulfur, hydrogen, and carbon dioxide. What we call this type of extremophile is a chemolithotroph, which chemo means chemical, litho means rock or stone, and troph would uh, refer to feeding itself. So they utilize inorganic compounds from their environment to create these beautiful colors. And this all happens with oxygen, these gorgeous colors. We're jumping into invertebrates now. This is probably my least favorite slide, but we need to talk about these insects and we need to talk about flies. The first fly in the upper uh, left-hand image is a blowfly. I've seen these guys before. I thought they were just houseflies, but there are so many species of flies as decomposers that it's, it would be hard to keep them all straight, unless maybe if you were an entomologist. The lower image uh, under the blowfly is a housefly. He looks very typical of your typical housefly with the stripes on his, uh, the top of his abdomen. In the upper right hand image, we see that little drosophilia that is a, a fruit fly. And flies typically are thought to be unsanit in unsanitary conditions. There's a lot of decay. Um, flies can carry uh, bacteria and viruses, so it's very important that you try to minimize the amount of flies that you have, uh, say, in your kitchen around your food preparation areas. But what flies do that is so gross is that they vomit digestive juices onto whatever it is they land on, particularly a food source. And what they do is they use their proboscis, which is a long tongue-like structure. If you look at the lower right-hand image, that's a close-up of a fly, and you can see his proboscis down onto a solid surface. And then what he does once he vomits through his proboscis is that those digestive juices, he can then suck up using his labella, which is a sponge-like tip on the proboscis that allows him to slip the slurry. Pretty gross. And then the, the image inset on top there are the larva of the fly, and as flies are decomposing and breaking down organic matter, they can also use the organic matter to lay their eggs on or in. And then when the larva hatch, they have a readily available food source for them to start decomposing as well. Here are a few more invertebrates, a June bug, a house a centipede, and then also a millipede. I used to get confused about what the difference between a centipede and a, a millipede was, so I decided to throw this image in. It just gives a little uh, better idea pictorially of the difference between a millipede and a centipede. But these guys are decomposers. Let's talk about some more invertebrates and we'll stay on the, the thread of termite, or excuse me, insects, and we're gonna discuss termites for a minute. Termites ingest wood they're also known as detritivores, which means wood eating. And termites are grouped according to not only their nesting, but their feeding habits. And there are over 2,000 species of termites across the globe. These guys are mostly subterranean soil dwelling insects. Um, they like damp or dry wood, and even some termites will eat grass. They rely on a, sim, on a symbiotic relationship with a protozoa. A protozoa is a single-celled animal that's larger than bacteria, yet it's still microscopic. So these protozoa hang out in the gut of the termite, and they help the termite digest the cellulose from the wood. But in turn, those gut protozoa that help the termite rely on a symbiotic bacteria that help them to produce the digestive enzymes needed for the protozoa that can then help the termite digest the cellulose from wood. This whole nutritional relationship I just explained is what's called an example of mutualism, where one or more organisms benefit from, 
from a relationship. And just one more slide here. Actually, I want to go back for a minute here and talk about um, this image on the lower, the lower right. This big stack is a termite nest, and they're actually, they have a peculiar name. They're called termiturariums. So just like it sounds, it's a terrarium has everything it needs on the inside, and the structure just happens to be built big on the outside. And these termite nests can be taller than a man. So let's finish up here on uh, termites. Some species of termites practice what's called fungiculture. Uh, they maintain a garden of a specialized fungi that gain nourishment from the termite excrement or from termite poop. <laughs> so the termites will ingest the fungi, eat it, and then pass the spores through the body of the insect guts. And then that actually completes the fungi life cycle. So from be beginning to end, this fungi is included in uh, the diet from mouth to exit for these termites. One other thing I wanted to mention here is a group of bacteria called actinomycetes. Now, mycetes on the end of this word is very similar to fungi in the different mycetes that we talked about. The reason that this bacteria is named actinomycetes is because it is similar to a fungi in that it can create hyphae as well and break down woody material. And in the process, create antibiotics such as streptomycin and urethromycin. They do this through anaerobic conditions, meaning there's a lack of oxygen in the atmosphere that they need in order to uh, produce those antibiotics. So they don't need air to do that. They can do that without air. Invertebrates continued, nematodes. Nematodes are roundworms. They're actually an insect, believe it or not. Uh, they don't have any segments. They don't have really a head, a thorax at all, or an abdomen. They're one continuous glass noodle, if you ask me. Um, but they have smooth, unsegmented bodies. And they're usually transparent, which means you can see through them. Most of them are microscopic and also parasitic. Parasitic means that an organism will use a host organism for its benefit at the cost of the host's health. So that's where a parasite, you hear the word parasite come in. Nematodes will not only eat other insects, and they do this by injecting bacteria into them and then, as we mentioned, slurping the guts out, uh, or parasitizing the host. That would be, say, you have a roundworm that got into, say, one of your pets, and uh, you might have to take it to get treated at the vets. But most of the time, uh, nematodes are just in the soil for the most part. But too many nematodes can cause a lot of issues for woody plants. It can cause galls or knots, um, excessive branching, distorted leaves, uh, root nodules on uh, woody plant materials. And nematodes can be dangerous to humans, so it's really important that even though we need them as decomposers, that we don't over overstep that um, and still be respectful of we don't we don't need nematodes or roundworms in our immediate environment but they are helpful in the environment uh, specifically in compost piles so they're not all bad you can see from this image here the, the lower image those are some knots and galls that are formed on the roots because the microscopic nematodes are inside the roots so it causes a strange warty knobby growth to occur. And if too much of this happens on a plant, particularly in its root zone, this could cause plant failure where the plant dies. Invertebrates, annelids, or segmented worms. Here are our earthworms. I love our earthworms. Uh, so just, they're, they're just really great. What they do is they eat not only soil debris and plant residues, but they help break the soil down into individual soil plates. And those, those nutrients and, and micronutrients become increasingly bioavailable to other organisms in the environment. Most, uh, most immediate would be plants, the availability of nutrients to local plants. 
Worms also deposit casts or feces on the ground or in the soil. Uh, but the casp is beneficial because it also breaks down soil particles, um, forming tiny granules. Another good thing about earthworms is they eat those harmful nematodes that might be in our soil. To look at the bottom image, the little, the little piles that you see there, that's, that's actually worm poo, that's a worm casting. Uh, I always wondered what those were, and now I know. Roly polies, pill bugs or sow bugs. We all love these little guys, they're so cute. Basketball bugs is another name for them. You touch them and they'll curl up in a little tiny ball and they're protected like a little crustacean armadillo. So yes, these little guys are actually crustaceans. They're also known as wood lice. They eat dead or decaying leaf litter, wood fibers, wet plant parts. They also eat dead bugs and apparently have been known to eat uh, shed snake skins. So the word that we can use for these little guys is that they're opportunists. They will try to eat anything they can decompose. And I have to give it to the roly polies because they are very industrious. I actually uh, watched a uh, pill bug pull a piece of mulch across the step to my porch and I just thought you got to give it to that little guy. He was working really hard for that piece of mulch that he wanted to eat wherever it was he was going. Interesting to note about pill bugs is that they can temporarily remove toxic metals from the environment such as copper, zinc, lead, and cadmium. And they do this once they ingest it. It actually crystallizes those ions in the gut of the roly-poly. And then once they're crystallized, they're sort of like little compartmentalized bits. They're stored in their secondary mid-gut. And then eventually they will be expelled. These little guys are very sensitive to environmental change. They are what we call an indicator species. Uh, because they are sensitive to environmental change, if we notice a change in the numbers of roly-polies that we're seeing, we might want to pay attention that something more is going on in, env in our environment than we may be aware of. Furthermore, roly-polies provide a food source for other organisms too. Crayfish and crawdads, uh, they're delicious. <laughs> related to lobsters and uh, crabs. These little guys are filter feeders. So what they do is ingest dead plant tissues and other organic particles that will flow across their gills and then they uh, ingest those. They've been known to eat pretty much everything and therefore they're known as omnivores. So omnivore means eat everything pretty much. And so I guess that would sort of make them a type of opportunist too. These little guys are tasty decomposer edibles. Now snails and slugs, I love snails and slugs. These little guys do so much hard work as long as I guess you don't want them in your vegetable gardens. But I love them and I don't mind them on my flowers and my flower beds. They are as well omnivores, eating rotting vegetation, but they'll also eat dirt, excuse me, soil. Let's be respectful of uh, our ground there and fungi. They will also eat dead others of their kind, uh, but they're finishing that cycle of putting uh, nutrients back in the soil. They may leave little slime, slime trails everywhere, which you know you can see evidence of even when they're gone, but this little lubricated trail helps them glide as they move, and it also doubles as a glue to hold them to um, an object or uh, some type of material that it wants to adhere to. And slugs and snails are also food for other higher organisms. In conclusion this evening, we can see how important our decomposers are and that they're such a vital part of our food chain. The FBI complete the recycling process of returning dead and decaying organic matter back into the soil so waste is turned into usable energy through nutrient cycling for other organisms. So the carbon and nitrogen cycles are very important here. They're largely responsible for the hummus layer that we have on forest floors, the compost piles that you might have in your backyard, 
soil organic matter or amendments. And then finally, just being able to convert those inorganic minerals uh, into substances that can be used by higher plants and animals. For further information on FBI, you can visit Microbiology Society at microbi microbiologysociety.org. You can additionally check out the website for North American Mycological Association. Mycological uh, deals with specifically fungi. And then there's the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. So there's three great references here if you want more information on fungus, bacteria, or invertebrates. If you want to stop by CDPL, we have some great references up on the second floor. We have a couple books totally dedicated to morel mushrooms, and here's one here by Michael Phillips. We have Peterson's Guides are really the greatest. So we have a Peterson Guides to Mushrooms of North America. The Lives of a Cell, which is a phenomenal book. It gives you so much input into what goes on in a single cell. Never Home Alone, Microbes to Millipedes. And then finally, we have Microcosm. So we have a lot of good books uh, for reference that you can check out here at your own local public library. So congratulations. I want to thank all of you. You have completed your FBI training and are now uh, part of the Department of Decomposition. So you better have an idea and understanding of how important our decomposers are to um, completing the food chain and the food web. Thank you all of you for coming out this evening. Um, hope you had a little fun with the down and dirty and the icky and yucky. Um, we will be having a book raffle tonight. So this image that you see here for Unseen Worlds, this book will be raffled away tonight. Um, and with that stipulation, uh, it's for Montgomery County residents only, unfortunately. And you do need to submit a question or comment to the email address listed here, ask at cdpl.lib.in.us. If you could please send a question or comment on tonight's program, we would greatly appreciate it to know that our programming is still reaching you and having a positive impact. And finally, before we end tonight's session, I just want to put a plug out for a new series that we'll be having coming this fall, starting in August. We'll be offering a four-part geology series. The first program will deal with mineral identification. The second program will deal with different kinds of rocks and where they can be found and how they were formed. The third program will focus on fossils specifically of Indiana. And then finally, the fourth program will conclude with plate tectonics and the seismic zone that's right here in Indiana. Who would have thought we have a potential earthquake zone in Indiana? So we'll learn about some of, well, we'll learn a lot about all this interesting information. So we hope you stay tuned. Uh, please uh, keep checking back on Facebook. We hope to offer in-person programming starting in August. However, if not, you will definitely see us here on Facebook Live. With all that said, thanks again, and we look forward to the next time. Good night.